Uh, I'm very interested in, um, I guess, seamlessness between. Um, okay, like rather than seeing um, the separateness, the, the seamlessness of yeah. being in the world but not of the world. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, it is one of the great paradox. It is all one, you know. It is all one because that's how it's made, that's its reality. And we have created this slightly bizarre consciousness yeah. that makes us experience that it's not one. And so, in a way, the mystery, I suppose, is not that it's all one, is what on earth did we do? Yeah. But I don't think we have time to explore that in too much detail because I think there is an urgency to return to what is fundamental about life. And then it works. You know? Because it's one. That's why I find it very beautiful seeing the perspective of oneness. A gathering like this is consciousness of oneness coming together. You have, been, you have the image that you are all individual people coming somewhere in Mill Valley for a gathering. But that's just really a mental concept. There is another perspective that sees this as, in a way, I see it more like a gathering of light cells of oneness for the sake of the whole. And I am fascinated as what is the potential when light cells that carry the consciousness of oneness come together in time and space for the sake of the whole. And I this think... This is much bigger than yeah. any individual yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean, in a way, there never is an individual thing. Yes. That, that's again a myth that is created by our separatist society. Yeah. But it's what happens when you, as she said, when you carry the intention, because intention is very, very important. Intention is like the seed that creates the acorn that creates the oak. And there, is, there are two sorts of intention on a very basic level. There is your personal ego intention, which is, you know, I want to buy an SUV, right? Or I want fries for dinner. Or, or, you know, whatever it is. And then there is the divine intention that is given to your higher self that comes mm -hmm. into your consciousness, all right? And what we are working with here is divine intention because people wouldn't come from personal intention to sit and hear me talk on a Sunday afternoon when you could be, you know, doing all sorts of other things. So there is a divine intention present. And how a divine intention works in the world is, again, for me, quite fascinating. Because, because divine intention carries, to put it very crudely, the intention of the divine. And what is it that the divine wants to do? And again, the only thing I know as a mystic is the divine has plans much bigger than our plans has vision much bigger than our vision, and also knows how to do things because it's the divine. And I always say it's the best company to work for. You know, you don't get yeah. necessarily the fringe benefits you might expect, but it's a kind of long-term investment. And if the world belongs to God, the divine knows how to make things happen. But they aren't the way, they aren't according to our plans. And so that's what... And also, again, I repeat this because we have been fed a particular myth, which is that if you want to change something, you need a really big organization to do it. You need to get together you know, thousands of people, or if you're lucky, millions of people to change something. But this in the past has never been the case. What created the Renaissance that, that changed enormous amounts in, in Western Europe was a guy on a donkey coming from Constantinople to Italy and creating an esoteric group. That's what changed the Renaissance and gathering a few artists like Leonardo and Michelangelo into a particular esoteric school. And it's throughout the whole culture, history of humanity, you know, it, it has been small groups of people coming together that have changed human culture. But 
we have been fed this myth that you've got to have millions of people you know, signing up to be able to do anything. I'm not quite sure why this you know, myth is... It's called, because it's not historically accurate. And so to have a small group of people like this that carry a divine intention, to me is very powerful and quite revolutionary. And then the beauty is, is that there is this network of small groups of people that can function organically, that, that, that belong to the organic structure of the spiritual body of the world. And that also interests me, how that is going to work. And it doesn't, and please remember, it's not, again, we've, we've been conditioned to think that things are gonna act, have to act linearly over a long period of time. But spiritual things happen exponentially. They, they get accelerated. And that's why I think the internet is a very good example, because it shows how a particular quality of consciousness, which is what the internet is, and a technology to go with it, changed exponentially, and is still changing exponentially. So that's, that's why I'm very fascinated by what happens when, as I say, a, a group of light cells that carry a divine intention come together. Because that's what human beings are, the cells of light. Very beautiful. You see them somewhere. Very beautiful. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm one person who did buy a book. Thank you. <laughs> hey. It was the light of oneness. Right. And the very last page, you share a vision. Uh, you share something, a beautiful one that stayed with me. And you say there's a theater and the curtain is rising. Yeah. And the stage is a stage, but it's not a place. It's yeah. a quality. Yeah. A quality of being, a quality of intimacy. Yeah. And I thought, wow, something is coming, and it's, it is rising, and it's a quality. Yeah. And so I wanted to say more about that, because it fascinated me and drew me, but I didn't quite know uh, where yeah. that's going, or that, where that came from, or what you're thinking underneath that. It has to do with the quality of being. It has to do with a certain intimacy. I also associated with something I wrote recently called Simple Answers, in which I saw that the way things are changing is that people are coming together in different ways. And it is like the most simple human qualities that we have somehow overlooked in our technological rushing around. Like the simple quality of, of friendship, of being together, that are vitally important to being human. And that there are these groups of people forming and whether they're, again, whether it, the internet is actually part of this. There, there is, a, for example, a, a website of somebody, I think she's called Baghdad Girl, I don't know if she's still around, who had this website about cats and pictures of cats and apparently people from all over the world sent her their pictures of their cats. And there's this whole website of all these cat lovers it is something very, very simple. You see, what, as far as I can see, when life regenerates itself, it doesn't go for the most complex computer model. It goes back to what is essential, to what is most simple. And one of those very, very simple qualities is, is human friendship, which we've kind of overlooked. And in this culture, people have become strangely very, very isolated. Um, just knowing one's neighbors, just you know, saying those simple patterns of relationship. And through those patterns of relationship, you know, there, there can be love, there can be companionship. And again, we've, we, we've been conditioned to think we've got to go and sort it out and we've got to have a plan. And we've, this is masculine hierarchical thinking. Somebody knows what's best and they're going to tell other people how to do it. And I really don't think it's like that. And I think there are these deep human qualities that have to do with just caring for each other and caring for the planet and, and doing things with care and attention that are what's needed to, to redeem something that's been desecrated. And another quality which I feel has to come back to life is joy. And it's, I've looked at joy very carefully because 
joy is very different to pleasure. Jo pleasure is you get, you know, because like a good meal gives you pleasure or some nice music gives you pleasure. But joy belongs to life itself. If, if what you're doing is, is really close to life, you feel joy in it. it. It can be doing the dishes, it can be sweeping the yard, it can be whatever. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If it really belongs to life, it's a direct expression of life, you can find joy in it. And if people were given back joy, then you know, if you're in a state of joy, you don't need to go and buy stuff you don't need. You just respond to life completely differently. You're in empathy with life. Because life, life is a joyous expression of the divine. You just, you know, you look at the kids outside. I mean, they're much closer to it than we are. We've got to think about it. They can live it. Um, and qualities like that, if they're given back to us, if they awaken again within human experience, I mean, on the most basic level, you know, who wants to fight when you can be friends? I mean, even in, if you listen to, because the Iraq war is so much in the consciousness and the news, you know, but what you really hear from people living in Baghdad is, is they just want their neighborhoods back so they can, you know, so they can have a meal together without being frightened. So they can, their kids can go to school. Human beings don't want a lot, but somehow we've, gone off on a tangent. And my sense is that the, you know, the next civilization is not going to be this fantastic, technologically advanced. We've kind of done that. You know, yes, there are going to be, there are going to be you know, technological changes, sure. But that isn't going to be the focus because we've lost the humanity in this road. And we need to reawaken certain very basic human qualities or they need to be reawakened. I mean, that's, that's my take on it anyway. I have a question about the needing the earth or needing the spirit of the earth to help make this change. Yeah. People used to know how to work with the earth and it was part of their everyday lives. It mm -hmm. was how they got their knowledge, I think. Mm -hmm. If we're going to do that now, do we need that knowledge? Do we need, or do we just need a consciousness that there is a problem and a willingness to, yeah, that to is be a used? Very, that is a very deep question, which there were ancient traditions of how to work with the energy of the earth, particularly some shamanic traditions, or particularly in, in Tibet, they worked a lot with the, the shamanic tradition and also Buddhist tradition, they worked a lot with the earth devas and the energy of the earth. And there were other cultures before. I'm, for example, quite convinced that Stonehenge in England was a, a sacred site that worked with certain earth energies. You can see how all the ley lines come together at that place. And uh, many Christian cathedrals are actually built upon convergence of ley lines, suggesting that even there was an understanding of how to work with the energies of the earth, which we apparently have lost now. Um, those traditions really got lost. And I know some people tried to kind of, to find them again, but th th there is a, a cycle of spiritual knowledge like a river, it goes underground, it reappears again in a different way in a different place. Um, and there are different ways also to work with the, to work with the earth energies, but my sense is we have to be taught anew. And because in those cultures in the past, how did they learn? Because they were taught. Who taught them? The earth taught them. And it, there are devas within the earth that are very powerful. And there is also a change. What people don't realize is there is also, just as like there are shifts in the archetypal world, there are also changes 
in the Davic world, in the energy of the earth. This is just because we are so identified with our human predicament, we understand that. We, the fact that the, there could also be shifts and changes in the, in the world of the devas, in the world of the earth energies. For example, there is now a very powerful energy just here in the Bay Area that belongs to the next stage in evolution. And part of my work has been to, to learn how to be with the, the deva, with the earth energy that is here and to learn how to work with that and what incantations, um, if you ever get a chance again to actually to listen to the recording of the last event, as I said, what I didn't realize until afterwards that, that the talk I was apparently giving you here was actually an ancient evocation of the energy of the earth that was under the words, that was certain phrasing that belonged to an ancient evocation of the energy of the earth. And it is, and there are energies in the earth that are going to be awakened, that are needed for the next stage of human evolution, just as there were energies in, in, in say, in the west part of England that belonged to one time, there were energies in Egypt that belonged to another period of human evolution. Um, and I think that if we are open and receptive, we can learn. Because this is part of the feminine wisdom of listening, of being, of being receptive, of being open, of not being too conditioned about how it should be. There are very powerful energies in the earth. And there are certain people who are being attracted actually to work with them, who will in time be trained how to work with them, how to activate their energy, how to help it to benefit mankind. We haven't quite got there yet. It's too, um, we're still at the cusp of this new era. Um, but it has traditionally been the, you know, the earth devas who have selected human beings, who have trained human beings how to work with them. This is how it has always been. Why should it, why should it change? And because wisdom comes from the inner world. And there is also then the whole question which, is a, which has to do with alchemy which has to do with the light hidden in the darkness, the energy that is with working with that, bringing heaven and earth together. I was actually very, in recently, only recently, I started to, to read the Emerald Tablet, which some of you may know is kind of the, the most ancient alchemical text. And I'll just read a little bit, and I won't, I'm not an alchemist, so I won't, uh, um, this is one translation. There are different translations of the Emerald Tablet. But in truth, certainly and without doubt, whatever is below is like that which is above, and whatever is above is like that which is below, to accomplish the miracles of the one thing. Just as all things proceed from one alone by mediation on one alone, so they are born from this one thing by adaptation. Just listen to this is Written. Peter, when was it written, the Emerald Tablet? Long time ago. Long time ago. <laughs> I mean, this is, what? This is, this is just so similar to what we're talking about now. Just as all things proceed from one alone, by mediation on one alone, so they are born from this one thing by adaptation. Its father is the sun and its mother is the moon. The wind has borne its body, its nurse is the earth. It is the father of every miraculous work in the whole world. Its power is perfect if it is converted into earth. Separate the earth from fire and the subtle from the gross and with great prudence. It rises from earth to heaven and comes down again from heaven to earth and thus acquires the power of the realities above and the realities below. In this way, you will acquire the glories of the whole world and all darkness will leave you. And if you think of the work we have been doing here, it has been to do with 
the above and the below, the, the, the mystical vision of oneness, that mystical understanding of oneness, and bringing that into relationship with the oneness that belongs to the earth, to the sacred being of the earth. That is, from earth to heaven and comes down again from heaven to earth, and thus acquires the power of the realities above and the realities below, the, the, the energies of the two worlds. In this way you will acquire the glories of the whole world and all darkness will leave you. This is the power of all powers, for it conquers everything subtle and penetrates everything solid. From thus, the little world is created according to the prototype of the great world. From and in this way, marvelous applications are made. That's just part of the emerald tablet, but that, is, that has to do with the, the alchemy, the transformative alchemy and the power that is released by that alchemy. This has been a whole mystery, esoteric science that has been hidden from humanity. It's been given technological mysteries, but the mystery of working with the earth energy in that way and working with the light hidden in matter and the power that is released through that has been, this is a tradition that has been kept, you know, kept by a few alchemists over the centuries, this whole heritage that is now beginning to reawaken. And we have what that could mean, not just on an individual level, but on a global level, we have no understanding because it is, um, you know, as it says, this is the power of all powers. We have, that's why I wrote this book, Spiritual Power, to begin hopefully to remind people there is a whole dimension of power, of spiritual power, whether it belongs to a, a transcendent divinity that can bring this energy of truth, of love, of this power that belongs to God and to the world, or also belong the power, that spiritual power that belongs to the earth, that, that can change things in ways we can't imagine. And I say this whole aspect of spiritual power has been hidden for the last 2,000 years or more, and what it could mean. So the which has to do with earth magic and what it could mean if we are given again the magic of the world. Are we mature enough to be able to work with it? Are we responsible enough? We, we are like children, but maybe some of us in the, have grown up enough to be able to be given access to that spiritual power and what that would mean to the whole transformation of the world. And that it's not some spiritual ideal. This is what people forget. It's, it's very interesting how from time to time, for various reasons, humanity burns the books. Like what happened at Alexandria and various other cultures. All the great libraries of the esoteric that contained all the esoteric knowledge of hundreds and hundreds of years gets destroyed. And uh, the Sufis said if God wants to destroy something, he puts it into the wrong hands. And, and there is a reason that that is, you know, that various spiritual knowledge is, is given and then taken away. And I know that we can't make this shift into consciousness of oneness without a certain power being given back to humanity because there is so much, the forces of darkness that keep us in the grip of materialism are so strong so tremendously strong and so, and we can't be freed of them just by, you know, a few websites or well-intentioned individuals because power needs power. But what it would mean, I don't know, because we haven't had access to it for a very long time. And, and I guess my sense is that there are people who are being trained, whether knowingly or unknowingly, to work with these energies. Or if you believe in, in reincarnation, there are people who are being reborn now who used to work with these energies. And then when the time comes, you, they will get given back the knowledge that belongs to them. But this is, you know, we, we have as a culture for so long lived in this very three-dimensional world. That only if something is real or you can grasp it with the mind 
Only if you can touch it is it real or if you grasp it with the mind that we, our culture, our conditioning has very, very carefully, you know, censored out the spiritual dimension. Very, very carefully until we now think that spirituality is something you, you do to yourself to realize a certain awareness. Yes, sure, but that is only one little aspect of spirituality. And, you know, you think how different cultures have rewritten their history and we forget how we have rewritten our entire history to, to censor out what doesn't belong to this material culture that we live in. And we have censored out enormous parts. That's why I like it when you get, you know, one of the reasons I like something like Shakespeare is there are there are pointers there, like in Midsummer Night's Dream, in, 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 in Puck, and in Oberon, Lord of the Fairies. There was still a memory in the culture that Shakespeare expressed of a whole magical dimension being alive. And you can see it. You, you glimpse it from time to time. It's, 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 it's fascinating to see where it... We get it a bit in fairy stories, but even then they have been censored a lot. That there was a time when everything was alive, when everything was magical, and, and we, have, we haven't completely forgotten. It fascinates people. I think that's why something like the Lord of the Rings is so potent. And even the, you know, the Harry, Harry Potter stories that, that had this, you know, there are the muggles, and the ordinary people who don't believe in the magical world, because we have this hunger, this longing to reawaken, because we know somewhere there is a magical world. We know it's it's just here, just like what's it in Harry Potter? It's you know you go to you go to the train station. It's it's platform twelve. Is it twelve and a half? I can't remember. Nine and three, nine and three quarters. There you go. You go to platform <laughs> nine and three quarters. We, we know that it's just there on platform, platform nine and three quarters, and we can't get it, and we long for it, and, and what happened to it? What happened to this whole, you know, we've been given this, this kind of very censored version of our own human history. And it, it isn't like that, and we know it's not like that somewhere. And there are people who, come into the world today who have memories of it not being like that. But how do you access it? You know, will you go to a few seances or whatever? No. There, as I said, there were whole libraries. In Tibet there were whole libraries. Alexandria had whole libraries. There were cultures that... It's all very detailed. It, it, there, there are whole deep, detailed esoteric knowledge of how to work with the earth. Can we do it like that now? No, because it's different. The books are going to be rewritten. Have I seen how it's going to be? Yes. Because at the very beginning, in the year 2000, I was shown how it can be for humanity. Yeah, incredibly beautiful. Unbelievably beautiful. And what can be given back to humanity that humanity has forgotten? A way of life that is very, very simple and... and there are some qualities that are going to be given back to humanity. One, as I mentioned, is joy. The other is the whole fun of creation, which we've lost. Life is no longer fun. It's, this world is, not, is a divine experiment. He, he's creating something. Actually, the Sufis say he recreates something new every moment. It is being continually being create, recreated. We are continually being created. You are not going to the same, the same people who leave this room as you were when you came in. And if you've allowed, your, even, your brains will have been altered a bit to bring in this energy of oneness. What does it mean? I don't know. Are we supposed to know what it means? I doubt it because it's, it's his game. It's his experiment. We are a little light cell. You know, and it's like the Sufis say, can the frog understand the ocean? No. But we can get a taste of water, we can drink a bit, we can, we can party a bit, because creation is also a party. It's this extraordinary interplay of the divine and humanity, which we've some, for some reason we said the divine's in heaven and we've got to do it on our own. We can never do it on our own. And, you know, even all of the, the worlds of the devas and um, all of that, I remember talking to, when I was in, in uh, Germany, some people were there from Turkey, 
And you know, I was talking about how we've isolated ourselves from the world of the devas. And this woman came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, in my, when I hear my grandmother and her friends sitting around the kitchen table, it's all present for them. All the devas and elementals, they're all present. They, they live with them. And so how it's going to be, I don't know. But it's, a, it's an experiment. It's an experiment in human consciousness, in divine consciousness. It's an experiment in waking up. Can one wake up large portions of humanity? It hasn't been done before. There have been very, very small groups. Yes, there was this society in Atlantis and apparently it didn't work out that well. It's not around to tell the tale and those books have gone too. So, who knows? One thing is, certain things have to happen in California first. That's actually part of the tradition. There's a certain energy here that enables something to be woken up here. And so that's one of the reasons we're doing this work here. You can't, uh, it doesn't mean it can't go around the world, but there's a certain energy here in California, particularly in the Bay Area, that enables something to happen. There's a certain earth energy here. There's a certain magnetic field that belongs to the next stage of human evolution, which is going to be so different to the last era of human, human evolution, people have no consciousness. And the only way one knows that is because if you've been on the spiritual path, when you flip a level of consciousness, it is completely different. You are a different person. The values you had before, what mattered before, even the friends you had before change. And what does it mean humanity enters an era of global oneness? We have no idea. My particular, my particular thing is if the heart of the world wakes up and begins to sing. That's one thing I've been shown. I've told it a lot of times. Because there was a time when, when the world sang. And you can see echoes of this in Australian Aboriginal culture. Because they are one of the most ancient peoples on earth, I think. They've been there for I don't know how many, 100,000 years or something. And they have in their tradition this, the whole meaning of the dream time and the song in which the, something in the world sings. And, and we have, in the West, it is not even in our, we have, we have forgotten even that we have forgotten. It is so far away. The time that, there was a time the world sang. And the song of the world is incredibly, incredibly beautiful. Just like the song of every human being is incredibly beautiful. Part of waking up as a human being is you hear your song. Every human being has a particular song. It's very, very, very beautiful. It's a song of the soul. It's the soul praising God in its own unique way, praising the creation, praising the creator. And it is actually part of what transforms the human being as their own song. We don't realize it because we have sanitized so much and we have lost so much, but you wake up a human being, just like you tell a human being their real name. And once a human being knows their real name, they are never the same because, because they know who they are somewhere. Not here, but somewhere. And, and the song of the soul of the world also is, is so beautiful. It's such a beautiful being, this planet. It's so beautiful, so old. And there is a possibility that it may start to sing again. And of course, if it sings again, that song can be heard not just in this world, but other places too. There are so many worlds. And so that is just a little bit, a little, a little page. So friends, God bless. Thank you so much for coming.